Hey up, the name's Dungood, Boyce Dungood, football manager. I'd like to welcome you to glory days, football in times of war. Here's a bit of film to watch, just to get you started. Football has a long, long history, and some of it is tied up with war. There's a tale that the first game of football was played using the head of a Danish prince killed in a battle, but I don't reckon that's true. In the reign of Henry V, playing football was against the law because it stopped men from practicing with their bows and arrows, which would be useful in battle. In 1914, when the First World War began, football was the most popular national sport, especially with young men just the right age to fight for their country. Entire football teams joined the army together, and some died together too. Football was still played in wartime as a way of keeping cheerful and a way of keeping fit. Many footballers joined up in the Second World War too, and many lost their lives. This site tells some of their stories and looks at how the Commonwealth War Graves Commission remembers them by recording their details and looking after their graves and memorials. Interesting, eh? But now it's time to meet a very well-known fellow who has something important to say to us. Hi, my name's David Beckham. Welcome to Glory Days Football in Times of War. I've been very proud to Captain England, but watching that film has made me think about all those players who gave up their careers to fight for their countries instead. We often talk about footballers as heroes, but the real heroes were those men and women, some of them footballers, who gave their lives in two world wars, and the servicemen and women who still fight for us today. Keep on watching, there are more interesting stories to come. Donald Bell was a defender for Bradford Park Avenue FC. On July 5, 1916, during the Battle of the Somme, he won the Victoria Cross for outstanding bravery by stuffing his pockets full of grenades, creeping up on an enemy machine gun post and capturing it. Five days later, he died, trying to repeat the same feat. Theo Walcott plays for Arsenal and England, serving his country in a different way. He's also very proud of his dad and his granddad, who were both in the RAF. Not so long ago, Theo was very pleased to be able to take his granddad on a visit to the Air Force's memorial at Runnymede and listen to some of his tales of his life in the RAF. William Jonas played for Clacton Orient, the old name for Leighton Orient. In the First World War, he served in the army alongside teammate Richard McFadden, who reported William's last moments. Both Willie and I were trapped in a trench near the front in Somme, France. Willie turned to me and said, Goodbye, Mac. Best of luck. Special love to my sweetheart, Mary Jane, and best regards to the lads at Orient. Before I could reply to him, he was up and over. No sooner had he jumped out of the trench, my best friend of nearly 20 years was killed before my eyes. Richard McFadden was killed three months later. Hello, my name is Stephen Frank, and I was just nine years old when I was sent to Theresienstadt concentration camp um, because I was a Jew and not because of something I had done. In the camp itself, um, it was grim, there was death, there was starvation, there was disease, but the, the Germans liked to make it a show camp to the outside world, and the uh, Swiss Red Cross visited the camp in um, 1944 um, and a lot of show was put on for them and it included a football match which I witnessed which was held in the Dresdner Caserna there and I particularly remember um, it was against the, in, against the guards and uh, the, the inmates, um, the goalkeeper of the inmates made a fantastic save um, and that's really about all I can really remember about the football match but it just briefly took us out of the misery that we were experiencing in the camp. And when the game was finished, of course, we were back to the old ways, starvation, death, destruction, and all those sort of things that went on there right to the end of the war. If you've seen Saving Private Ryan, you'll know how horrific the D-Day landings on the Normandy beaches were in June 1944. With remarkable spirit, shortly afterwards, a football match was organised on the sand landing craft via the ships. 
Hi, my name's Zoe Linkson and I work for the Daily Mirror newspaper. My great-grandfather was Oscar Linkson who played fullback for Manchester United. He helped the team win the 1909 FA Cup and the 1911 league title. In 1914 he joined the army. He was killed on the Somme and his body never recovered. His name is on the Teepval Memorial. Tom Cooper's last match for Liverpool was on April 20th, 1940. Two months later, on army dispatch duty, he was killed when his motorcycle collided with a bus. After an inquiry into his death, all army dispatch riders were ordered to wear crash helmets. At a Preston factory called Dick Kerr, where tramway and railway equipment was made, women had taken over the men's work while they were away at war, so it was no surprise that it took up football too. Dick Kerr ladies played matches to raise money for war charities and made £600 in their first game in 1917. Within three years, over 53,000 fans were watching them play at Goodison Park. They played abroad as well, going to France and Holland, where they were greeted like superstars. Walter Tull played for Spurs and Northampton Town. He was the first British-born black army officer and the first black officer to lead white British troops into battle. He was leading his troops in an attack on German trenches when he was killed instantaneously with a bullet through his head. In the carnage of the battle, his body was never recovered. He's commemorated on the Arras Memorial. No club sacrificed more in the First World War than Heart of Midlothian. In 1914, the Edinburgh Club sat at the top of the Scottish League, but despite the glory within their grasp, no fewer than 16 players joined up. Their action inspired many other players and fans to do likewise. Sadly, seven members of that famous Hearts team would never return home. Nowadays we, we, we look upon football and, and uh, winning championships and cups as the, the be-all and end-all. Well, those guys were on the, the cusp of you know, something great, something special, um, and they decided to put that to one side and, and give it up, obviously because uh, they felt that... Um, the, the matters and the, the, the war that was going on in Europe was, was more important than that. And uh, that really hits home and sort of gives you a, an idea of what uh, those guys must have been going through. Many football grounds were damaged during the Second World War, especially those in cities and near docks. The main stand at Old Trafford was destroyed by a bomb in 1941 and another bomb wrecked the terraces in cover. The pitch was badly scorched too. Man City to the rescue. Man U and Man City shared main road throughout the war years. Amazing stories. It's hard to imagine what it was like in those days. We should remember them always. I know I will, but will you? Visit the Glory Days and Mirror Football websites to find out more and why remembering those who died in two world wars is so important. Newfangled websites, eh? Well, here's the... Uh... Earls, or whatever you call them. www.cwgc.org forward slash glory days. This site tells some of their stories and looks at how the Commonwealth War Graves Commission remembers them by recording their details and looking after their graves and memorials. And www.mirrorfootball, all one word, .co .uk. They've got a brilliant collection of old football pictures going all the way back to 1903 and electronic reprints of the actual newspaper pages as they appeared at the time. If this has inspired you to find out more about football as it was played in the old days, you'll find plenty of fascinating stuff there.